So you want to be a high school coach. You see the glory they get. They're in the paper all the time. They're the conversation of many dinner tables around uh, the county. Let's talk about coaching. I'm going to give you the pros and cons. I'm going to start off with the cons, and then I'll get into the pros. So here's the cons. These are the things you need to be prepared to do if you want to coach high school sports. The first one, and probably the most challenging one, is raising money. School buses for transportation don't just pay for themselves. Uh, uniforms don't pay for themselves. And there's other expenses that come into, uh, you got to pay the referees. There's a host of things, host of expenses that you need to cover. So you need to raise money. And um, so I'm going to check that off our little list real quick. Let's raise some money. Boom, you got that. I'm going to give you some pro tips on raising money uh, in a minute. You got to keep track of your uniforms. This is uh, this is a pain. Pro tip for you here, create a spreadsheet. Make sure you uh, write each of your players' names and then the number that they uh, that they are assigned and then keep track of them collecting uniform and turning it in. Another pro tip for you, use gloves when handling uniforms, especially when you're collecting them. When you receive them, hopefully they're washed uniforms. Uh, but when they're turning them back in, sometimes the kids don't wash their uniforms. And I've uh, had staph infections from collecting uh, uh, players' uniforms on more than one occasion. So um, when the kids don't wash them, it's gross. So definitely emphasize the students washing their uniforms when they turn them in. Late night away games. Late night away games are a real challenge in the sense that sometimes if you have uh, a game you're playing that is an hour, an hour and a half away. If tip off is at 7:30, game is over about 8:45. You may not be home till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So uh, be strategic about your late night away games. You want it to be on a Friday night if possible, um, and if not, maybe a Thursday night. But late night away games. Understand that. Um, uh, you may not be home until 10 or 11. I'm going to give you a pro tip about late night away games in a minute as well. Here's one of them, which is parents picking up players late. That could be after practice. Uh, you're legally responsible for your players and supervising them. So if pra when practice is over, it's over at 6, 630, and you have a parent that doesn't arrive until 8 or 830, you may need to stay there with your players to make sure they're being picked up. Where that really becomes a challenge is on late night away games. If you have a parent that is uh, running an hour, hour and a half late, has an emergency or something, maybe a medical device rep or a surgeon who's called into surgery, you might be there till midnight waiting on parents. So uh, parents picking up students who are running late. Contracts. We don't just schedule these games out of the blue and say, hey, we're going to play this team on this day. Uh, the coaches usually have a preseason meeting at which you exchange contracts and you actually write out the legally binding contract on the date and the time that you are going to play the game. So you've got to uh, line up your contracts and have them in order. We talked a little bit about supervision, which is you're legally responsible for those students after practice being picked up, uh, after away games being picked up, and um, during games. When you're transporting students to and from games, um, if you have freshman JV and varsity, uh, while the other two teams are waiting on the third team to play, you uh, may need to uh, have somebody, a coach, supervising them in the stands. Typically, what I do is assign them homework, or not, not assign them homework, but have them work on their homework to keep their grades up while the other games are going on. And that come, brings us to our next bullet point, which is multiple games. Um, Frequently, you'll have JV and varsity games, but sometimes you'll have freshman games as well. So you could have a lineup of three different games. So uh, again, you need to be prepared for supervision, figure out meals, figure out uh, who's playing when. There's a host of things that go into multiple games. Bookkeepers and scorekeepers don't just show up miraculously. You need to have a consistent bookkeeper who knows what they're doing and somebody who can run the scoreboard, who knows how to reset the minutes and everything on the scoreboard if an error occurs. Uh, a lot of times people have family members, um, spouses, uh, plus ones, um, parents a lot of times. Uh, interestingly enough, when I've been coaching basketball, 
one of the things I see most frequent is the coach's mother doing it. That's the thing. Coach's mother's doing scoreboard. I've seen that on many, many occasions, actually. Um, we talked about supervision. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to get into some pro tips to help uh, save you time and make your life easier and talk about compensation, because as coaches, you get the big money. I'm only joking about that. I'll talk to you about some of the compensation you're going to receive for this. Hopefully you love the kids and love the sport because uh, you're going to make less than minimum wage. Yeah, I'm going to share four pro tips with you that are is going to save you a lot of aggravation and a lot of time. The first one is after an away game is completed and you load your players up onto the bus, the first thing you should do is have them call home and make sure that the rides are waiting for your for them at your school when you arrive. You'd be stunned how many kids just don't think about it. They don't do it. And when you arrive at the school, it might take 45 minutes or an hour for a parent to show up. So again, the first thing I would do when I load my students up from an away game is have them call home, give them your estimated time of arrival, and have the parents waiting for you. Um, there's going to be situations where parents, for whatever reason, can't pick them up, not for an hour or two. I've been up at the school till midnight on more than one occasion waiting for parents to pick up a student who can't drive. All right, the second pro tip for you. If you have an away game that is close to your school, maybe 15 minutes to 45 minutes or an hour out, you can set up a shuttle program with your school buses, which is uh, the bus arrives at your school, you load up freshmen and JV, the bus takes them to the venue, drops them off, uh, the freshmen play their game, JV waits in the stands. When the freshman game is over, you have that bus transport freshmen and their coach back to the school and pick up the varsity players and the varsity coaches and take them back to the school while JV plays their game. This way, you have your freshmen back at the school at a reasonable time so that they can go get dinner. The varsity can eat dinner while they're waiting on the bus. Um, the only team that kind of gets neglected is the JV team. So you definitely need to make sure that you make arrangements for them to have dinner at the game. It could be ordering pizza, uh, setting up something, uh, eating at the concession stand, or even having the bus. I've had the bus take them through drive through to McDonald's or something during the varsity game. Um, all right. Back to fundraising. We talked about fundraising. In addition to selling candy or whatever other things you're going to sell, you can, at least in the schools I've worked at, you can typically work concession for football and other sports. And when you do, they typically pay you out what they call shares. And shares can be working one concession uh, stand for a game equals one share working a couple of different concession stands can be two or three games and shares typically can be anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars where you get a percentage of the gate um, as far as what they make for concession so uh, concession is a great way to fundraise and then a last pro tip for you back to these away games is there are plenty of times when there was a local steak restaurant here in town that I eat at frequently where they close at 10 o'clock, but I've built up enough of a relationship with them that if I walked in, got done with an away game at five till 10, uh, I would zip in the door, they'd yell coaches here, throw the uh, prime rib on for me and have it done for me in 18 minutes. You want to build up a great relationship with a restaurant or two to where you walk in and they know exactly what you're getting. You sit down at the bar and they have you served in 18 minutes. So these are some pro tips that should help you uh, help reduce your stress, your aggravation and make you more efficient. Now let's get into uh, some of the pros that go into coaching. Many of my favorite moments in education over the last 27 years involve coaching sports. Now, don't get me wrong. I love being in the classroom. I love teaching students. I love working with them and seeing the light come on when they learn new ideas. But you get the same experience with coaching. And for those who are not athletically inclined and have not been involved with playing sports or coaching in any way, 
I want to share this with you. I used to struggle with should schools be involved with the amount of money it costs to have sports programs. And the bottom line is yes, for two reasons. The obvious one is it, it allows students to be engaged in an activity. It gives teachers leverage over those students if you're working with a good coach. For instance, if a football player is not doing their homework and you reach out to the coach, that usually solves the problem. The coach will usually take it from there and you won't have any more issues with that student. Or if you do, it will get corrected again. So it gives you leverage over the student. It creates buy-in with the student. Uh, it gives them some semblance of community. It can lead to athletic scholarships as well. But here's the other piece that I think a lot of people miss. Even administrators miss this. And if you're an administrator watching this, <clears throat> and I know I do have uh, several administrators who follow uh, my videos, I'll leave you with this thought. It's an opportunity for students to view someone besides their parent who they know, trust, and respect, and watch how they react to adversity and pressure. So it's crucial when you're hiring coaches that you hire the correct coaches, those who want to be role models, those who are going to be role models, and those who deal with pressure and adversity in the correct way. If you have a coach, even if they win you state championships, and they're not setting a good example, they need to go. Uh, I don't have any time for coaches who set bad examples for students. I don't care who they are or how great they are. Uh, I'll, I'll go on the record with that. And I, I'll, I'll stand up with my fellow coaches. All the coaches that I know and respect react well to adversity and understand that students are watching them. Um, and those that don't, they need to be gone. Yeah, so what is it like to coach sports? What is it like to have all that pressure? Let's talk about that a little more in detail now. The first thing you need to understand uh, in coaching, there is not much money. When I was coaching basketball, I believe it was either 2600 or 2800 spread out over four months. And if you are a playoff team, which we usually were, your season gets extended by several weeks, depending as to how far in the playoffs you progress. And then, of course, you have all the off-season training. So you're basically doing that for free. You're not even going to make minimum wage at coaching. So if you're coaching, you do it because you love the game and or because you love the students. In my case, it was both. I love the games and I love the students. I coach multiple sports. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, could that change someday? With NIL, NIL, NIL may be a game changer. Um, I think that some outstanding high school coaches probably will get NIL money at some point. It'll be interesting to see. But as of right now, I'd make sure you're doing it because you love the game and because you love the students and you love the sport. This is a truism, and you're going to want to commit it to memory and understand it, which is players win games, coaches lose them. I'll repeat that because you're going to want to memorize this, write it down, put it on your wall, and commit it to memory because this is going to become your life as a coach. Players win games, coaches lose them. What do I mean by that? Is that absolutely true? No, it's not true. Usually, if the, usually the coaches do a great job preparing those players, and that's why they have such success. And the coaches usually call pretty good players to, to get success. But the perception from the crowd is as follows, and I'll give you some examples. So a uh, football coach sees eight in the box, calls a screen pass, wide receiver scores a touchdown, crowd goes crazy. Everybody focuses on the pass and the wide receiver's uh, touchdown. You're never going to hear a high school uh, crowd tell you, hey, what a great play call that was. Uh, now, at the NFL and college level, the announcers will typically point things out like, hey, that was a great, uh, that, that screen pass was a great call. Same thing's true with all sports. You look at basketball. If you know the uh, opponent's point guard is struggling with his left hand and you, uh, press it and uh, run a one, two, two press, trap them, steal the ball. And one of your players scores the winning basket off of that. Uh, you're not going to hear people saying, what a great press you put them in. What a great play call. You're going to hear Johnny made a great athletic play and won the, the ball game. So get used to that. That's uh, that's what your life's going to become. Now, if you lose the ball game, be prepared for 
everybody second guessing who you played, how much time they played, what play calls you made, all of those things come into uh, fruition. Uh, my wife used to watch me uh, when I was coaching basketball and she would sit up in the crowd and a lot of people didn't know who she was and uh, she would just get to listen to what the parents were saying. And I told her, if anybody says anything to you, just tell them, you don't know what I'm doing either. So I had fun with it. And again, I had a pretty successful coaching career in basketball, so there wasn't too much criticism, but there was some. You, you, you're never going to please everybody, especially those uh, kids that are on the bench. You're going to hear a lot about how their kids should be playing. Um, so uh, get used to that truism. Players win games, coaches lose them. Be prepared for a lot of criticism. You have to have a thick skin if you're going to be a coach. And be prepared to uh, be dealing with a lot of parents. No matter how successful you are, you're going to have people who are not happy about playing time, not happy about positions. You can win championship after championship, be the greatest role model in the world. And if somebody's son or daughter is not playing that much, you're going to have some parent phone calls to work with. So um, be prepared that you are going to be the dinner conversation um, nightly uh, as far as uh, what coach did in a game or what coach said in a game or what coach did or said in practice. Um, you are going to be the dinner conversation even more so than teachers. So be prepared for a lot of attention. Make sure you keep a thick skin. And the, the main thing is uh, don't take it personally. No matter how, how personal things may become, I would uh, just understand that you need to look at it from this viewpoint, which is that the parents are advocating for their son or daughter, uh, depending on uh, what the issue is. Again, as I mentioned earlier, some of my favorite times of my high school teaching career is coaching. I absolutely love it. Love being able to model the correct behaviors for these kids, to teach them leadership skills, to help them come together as a team, all of the wonderful things that come out of sports. I've coached girls basketball, guys basketball, slow pitch softball, um, boys tennis, and my personal favorite, powder puff football. In powder puff football, there is zero dollars. There's no supplement that comes with powder puff football. That was just a labor of love. Uh, one football game or a couple football games if we were doing a tournament and um, uh, 10 practices was a perfect amount of football for me. I never wanted to be watching film on Saturday mornings or anything. So that was just the right amount of football. So it was a lot of fun. If you're looking to do something fun with the kids, powder puff football is a, a good way to go. Um, but I had to walk away from all of that uh, several years ago because I came across a second job after school that paid significantly more than coaching. As a matter of fact, it paid about 20 times what I was making as a coach. So for my family, it was the best thing to do. But I do miss coaching. It is worth it. You just have to have the right personality and understand that you are going to be the dinner conversation. You are going to receive a lot of criticism. And when you lose ball games, even when you come into class, you're going to hear from the students what you should have done differently. So uh, make sure you have a personality that can shrug all that off and you're resilient. Um, if you're a good role model and you can handle adversity, you'll make a good coach. All right, keep being heroes out there. Have a great one. Talk to you soon.